inspiring the world's most famous vampire, building a tower made of your victim's skulls, creating a human zoo. Only the most cold-blooded rulers in history could do this, and that's not even the worst they've done. With a nickname like Ivan the Terrible, it may seem obvious that Ivan IV was pretty harsh. Yes, you can make the argument that, at the time, the Terrible was more like formidable, but try and tell that to his enemies. Ivan, who lived and died in the 16th century, was the first Tsar of all Russia. Russia before then was actually an assemblage of loosely allied states. In the 1560s, Ivan began executing nobles who weren't sufficiently loyal. Ivan's personal guards got the now vacant land holdings and proceeded to terrorize the peasants. At least the peasants were sometimes able to move on, unlike Ivan's eight wives. They rotated through royal favor and exile alongside a series of mistresses. But his most cold-blooded action of all was surely the vengeance visited upon Novgorod in 1570. Fearing that everyone would defect to Lithuania, Ivan ordered that everyone in the city, including children, be tortured and executed. Unfortunately, such atrocities were typical of his style of conquest. For someone who's a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church, the stories told about Olga of Kiev are pretty hair-raising. Olga's backstory is sparse. We do know she was married to Prince Igor I of Kiev in the early 10th century. When Igor was killed around 945, Olga became Kiev's regent. A single woman in power was apparently both intimidating and attractive, so the marriage proposals started rolling in. Surprisingly, one of the suitors was a man connected to Igor's killers, the Drevlian Prince Maul. Olga pretended to play nice with the Drevlians, but when Prince Maul's emissaries came to negotiate the terms of the marriage, she tricked them into riding into town on a boat. Olga's representatives overturned the boat into a ditch and buried the men alive. A second group of Drevlians was later burned to death in a bathhouse. You'd think they'd be more cautious after that, but a third group retreated to a raucous party. Once they were all good and drunk, Olga and her servants slit their throats. She eventually declared war, burned their city, killed or enslaved the occupants, and collected an expensive tribute for good measure. In 1971, Ugandan General Idi Amin overthrew the nation's government and declared himself president. After Amin took power, tribal members who sided with the previous government were brutally killed. Anyone who seemed capable of opposing Amin was in danger. All told, Amin's rampant paranoia resulted in the deaths of a staggering 300,000 people over the course of just eight years. Toughness is good because uh, the people respect you. Amin's ruthlessness wasn't limited to the murder of his own people. A year after becoming president, Amin forced Asian immigrants out of the country, leading to a worker shortage and economic collapse. No surprise that Amin was deeply unpopular. In 1979, after antagonizing nearby Tanzania, he was ousted and fled the country. He lived in Saudi Arabia until his death in 2003 and was never prosecuted for his crimes. Being a ruler in medieval Europe was a tough gig. Things like international summits and diplomatic talks were few and far between, and treaties and alliances were broken at a whim. But even in this unstable world, Vlad III's brutality stood out. You may know him by a different name. I am Dracula. This 15th century Wallachian ruler in what is now Romania also went by Vlad III Dracula or Vlad Zepesh. And yes, Irish writer Bram Stoker drew upon this bloody man's name for his famous literary character Dracula. But what made Vlad so shocking? In his years-long struggle with both fellow nobles and the Ottoman Empire, Vlad developed a taste for impaling. If captured, his enemies could expect to be speared on tall wooden spikes, a slow, agonizing death. One 1462 battle reportedly resulted in thousands of such victims left behind to turn back Ottoman soldiers. Chronicles of the time claim that Vlad feasted surrounded by a forest of his victims. That may be the medieval equivalent of fake news. And again, maybe not. England's Mary I was a complicated queen. The eldest daughter of the equally thorny Henry VIII, she was declared illegitimate after her father dumped her mother for Anne Boleyn. Still, she managed to become the first independently ruling queen of her nation. Her life was full of cold-blooded calculation. For real, how could you survive in the court of Henry VIII without it? But things really picked up when she took the throne. Mary's father famously broke away from the Pope to marry Anne, but Mary remained a devout Catholic, and she was determined to stamp out Anglicanism and bring back the old way, and her tactics were brutal. She earned the nickname Bloody Mary after she had nearly 300 religious dissenters executed. Many of them were burned at the stake. Her violent persecution of Protestants remains a defining facet of her reign. It may be uncomfortable for Americans to call a president cold-blooded, but a look at Andrew Jackson's history of violent, racist behavior make it hard to deny. For one, Jackson was very, very pro-slavery. He built his fortune on the backs of enslaved people and treated them brutally, with public beatings and worse. 
As president, he specifically blocked the distribution of anti-slavery literature in the South, pushed back against laws that would abandon slavery in new territories, and said abolitionists should be killed for their work. Then there are the atrocities he committed against Native Americans. The color of this story is green, and it's the green of envy, and it's the green of coveting Indian lands. Jackson advocated for the removal of Native people from their tribal lands, in part because he wanted the lands freed up for plantations worked by slaves. Agreements were broken, payments to tribes were stopped, and local governments stripped the rights of tribal members. When he had Cherokee people forcibly removed from their lands, anywhere from 4,000 to 8,000 died as a result. That doesn't include all the Native people who died due to Jackson's other racist policies. Timor, also known as Tamerlane, was born in 14th century Transoxiana, now modern-day Uzbekistan. His father and uncle were tribal leaders, but were removed by outside forces in favor of Timor. But the newbie wasn't as much of a pushover as they hoped. He was quickly ousted, but earned it back after a stint as a brigand and mercenary. Timor got into the empire-building game, but he didn't take the diplomatic route. His tactics were intentionally awful, meant to psychologically defeat opponents before they were foolish enough to try anything. He used PR, spreading rumors of all the awful things he had supposedly done. He walked his talk, murdering thousands of civilians in the process. In Damascus, he burned down a mosque full of people, and in Persia, he leveled entire cities to the ground for opposing him. But he is most remembered ordering towers built out of the skulls of the people he murdered. Rana Valona, the first story, is complicated. She's remembered as a vicious ruler who used violence to impose her will upon the kingdom of Madagascar, but she also resisted colonialists who threatened to take over her homeland. It could well be that many of the more colorful tales of her cruelty were made up by sore loser colonialists. Rana Valona, originally known as Ram Avo, took power after her husband, Radama I, died by suicide in 1828. She wasn't in the line of succession, so she seized control by killing off Radama's more troublesome relatives. It was technically bloodless because spilling royal blood was a big offense back then. Instead, the official heir, queen mother, and others were strangled or starved to death. At that point, Ramabo became queen and renamed herself Ranavalona. Ranavalona was unfriendly to European powers snipping around her territory, though she did work with a French castaway, Jean Le Bourg, who became her weapons manufacturer. She brought slavery back into Malagasy society and forbade the construction of permanent roads, given that they would provide easy access for invading European forces. While some of the more distant rulers accused of heinous acts might be able to squeak by under claims of poor record-keeping, Joseph Stalin has no such excuse. As one of the most notorious world leaders of the 20th century, his crimes against humanity are well-documented. For a quarter of a century, he organized, he exploited, engaged in mass murder, until he dominated one-third of the world. Stalin's early years were a mix of childhood abuse, socialist idealism, and bank robbery. The 1917 Russian Revolution turned him into a communist hero and Lenin's sidekick. When Lenin died in 1924, Stalin declared himself dictator of the Soviet Union. All fairly ruthless so far, but Stalin had only just gotten going. Eventually, his idea of collectivizing agriculture led to widespread famine. The Great Famine of 1932 to 1933 killed an estimated 5 million people. Those who attempted to exploit the system or hide grain belonging to the state faced execution. Some of Stalin's most cold-blooded tactics included the establishment of harsh prison camps known collectively as the Gulag. Anyone seen as a threat to Stalin faced either harsh conditions in the Gulag or outright execution. An estimated 750,000 Russians were killed in the Great Purge of the 1930s alone, while many more were terrorized by the widespread climate of fear. If you read stories about Empress Wu Zetian, you might think she was especially bloodthirsty. Of course, many of the worst stories may be rooted in sexism directed at a powerful empress who ruled for over 50 years. But Wu had to be at least somewhat cold-blooded to survive as long as she did. She started off as a highly educated 14-year-old concubine of Emperor Taizong. Her charm and intellect got her promoted from laundry duty into the confidence of the ruler. What's more, she apparently caught the eye of Li Ji, Taizong's son. After his father died, Li Ji became Emperor Gao Zong and pulled Wu into his own household. Wu had a daughter who died shortly after birth. She accused Gao Zong's wife and another concubine of using witchcraft against the infant, got them exiled, and became Gao Zong's new wife. She was the power behind the throne, and when her husband died in 683, Wu assumed her sons, now legitimate heirs, would use her in the same way. When the two men pushed back, Wu had them dethroned and exiled and took the reins of power for herself. Though he created the Congo Free State, Leopold II of Belgium was invested in anything but freedom. Leopold's forces took the African territory in early 1885, making it the king's personal landholding. 
Leopold personally owned the territory rather than using the colonial model to exploit the people and resources there, but exploited they were all the same. Congolese people were forced to harvest resources like ivory. If they resisted, they were brutally punished. Tactics included things like chopping off body parts. Even children were mutilated and murdered. Other young Congolese were sent away to train as child soldiers. Malnutrition and disease killed many more. An estimated 10 million people died as a result of Leopold's policies. The Belgian king even had people shipped in from the Congo to stand around in a human zoo at his palace. Some of his descendants defend Leopold, saying that he never personally set foot in the colony, but he profited handsomely off the suffering there, all while claiming he was on a mission to civilize the country. It got so bad that even other colony-crazy European rulers were horrified, and Leopold's own parliament forced him to give up the lands. No collection of cold-blooded rulers would be complete without a mention of Genghis Khan. Genghis was a gifted military leader whose territories eventually encompassed some 12 million square miles. What's more, the Mongol Empire had some pretty progressive policies that encouraged women's rights, promoted cultural exchange, and eschewed torture. Most of the time. But the Mongol army sacked cities and murdered people along the way. The 1.7 million people of Nishapur in what's now modern-day Iran were killed after someone there killed Genghis' son-in-law. In another story, it's claimed that Genghis had a governor executed by pouring hot molten silver into the man's eyes and ears. While stories and numbers are difficult to verify, the impact of the Khan's movements are more stark. Mongol forces decimated entire cultures, like that of the Shishia people. Meanwhile, the genetic legacy of the Khan indicates that he, and perhaps his sons, weren't above assaulting women taken as captives. 